you've got your Bible, I hope you do, I want you to turn to Exodus chapter 2. We started a series, uh, maybe for those of you that weren't here last week, started a new series called The God Who Delivers, and it's a series from the book of Exodus, second book in the Bible, written by a guy named Moses. It is the story of the Israelite people uh, living out the promises of God to their ancestor Abraham, and uh, uh, now they find themselves in a difficult spot. Chapter 1 tells us the story of 70 of those family members, including Jacob and his 12 sons, one of them Joseph, who becomes the prime minister of Egypt, saves Egypt and all the surrounding area because he knows there's a famine that's coming, and he saves the grain, and he rises from obscurity to, uh, you know, to, to great royalty. But we're told in chapter 1 that at some point a new Pharaoh came along who didn't know Joseph and maybe didn't care to look into him, didn't know anything about a famine, didn't know anything about Joseph saving their people. And uh, the Israelite people are thrust into slavery. They are in bondage. They're trying to, to squelch the growth of this people. What had, become, what had started as 70 people now has become 2 million strong. And, and the people of Egypt are, are, are fearing that they would rise up and they would rebel against them. And so not only did they put them into slavery, not only did they work them long hours, but they began to, uh, to find a way to control the population telling those that were helping the birthing mothers to get rid of the baby boys. That didn't seem to curb anything because the midwives feared God and not the, the voice of Pharaoh. And so then they gave instruction for everybody, throw baby boys into the Nile River, get rid of them, let the river you know, uh, uh, cleanse the, the area, let them, let them get rid of all the, uh, the evidence. And yet here they continued to to grow. And so we get into Exodus chapter 2 where God's plan is going to become evident. But before we do that, we do need to take note here that at this point in time, uh, uh, all the heroes in the book of Exodus so far, and even into chapter 2, all the heroes in the book of Exodus have been women. Have you noticed that? Chapter 1, the heroes were the midwives, right? They're the ones that said, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to obey God, not Pharaoh. And so they save the little boys and they become the heroes. We get to chapter 2. We're going to read about Moses' mom. She's going to be a hero. Uh, she does something heroic. We're going to read about Moses' sister. We're even going to read about the daughter of Pharaoh. She's going to be a hero in chapter 2. All the women so far through chapter 2, have uh, all, all the heroes have been women. Can I get some ladies just to say amen to that? Okay, absolutely. We're reading it right right here. And so no names so far. We really don't know any of the names as we go through this, even into chapter one, chapter two. We'll read more about that. We'll get them, get them later on. But that's the story so far. We're going to catch it in some glimpses. We're going to see Moses' early, uh, Moses' birth, his early childhood, just briefly. We'll see uh, some adult stuff. And then we'll get down to the end of chapter two, where we see some general statements about how Israel is responding to God. So let's open it up, chapter 2, verse 1. And it says, Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. Why is she having to hide this baby? Well, because of what we understood in chapter 1, right? Uh, babies weren't being allowed to live, especially baby boys. So she has to hide this little one. We'll find out his name is Moses. This is Moses' mom and dad, okay? So um, it mentions that both of them are of the tribe of Levite. That means that they were of the family of Levi. We read at the very beginning of chapter 1, verse 1, and so that was one of the brothers of, 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 of Jacob or one of the sons of Jacob. And so we've got this particular tribe. This is not important now. It's going to become important later because we'll find out, uh, and Moses will, will let people know he is of the tribe of, of of Levi. That is the one that ultimately those who served in the temple and the tabernacle, they will do the priestly duties. And so Moses is going to come from that family and that, that lineage. It's going to be important. Okay. Also important right here is it says that she became pregnant and gave birth. That terminology is used 16 times so far in the Bible. Again, Moses wrote Genesis, Exodus, and the next three books. This is the 16th 
and also final time that he'll use that, usually talking about people who are going to you know, lead in some capacity. Last time Moses will use that, and he'll use it for himself. And then you get to that term right there, when they saw that it was a fine child. I don't know, I just keep coming back to like, cousin Eddie on Christmas vacation, you know, a fine child. What, what does that terminology mean right there? Well, it certainly means a good child, a, 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 a beautiful child, good-looking child. But when we go and read some other places where people are commenting on this, like in Acts chapter 7, where Stephen is preaching before he's going to die. And in Hebrews 11, the writer of Hebrews talking about people of faith, we find out that what is meant by that, this is more of the idea of being favored by God. This is a special child. Fine means this is not only a beautiful, good-looking boy, but he is special, and he has, there is something different about him. God's favor is upon him. His name's going to be Moses, verse 3. But when she could hide him no longer, well, like when he gets vocal and when, he, you know, you can't hush him up anymore. When she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and she coated it with tar and pitch. Why would she do that? Well, then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. That's the big river that runs through Egypt, right? So when she could not contain this little boy and he becomes so vocal that we can't hide him any longer, she puts him in a basket and she makes this basket waterproof so that she can put it in, in the river, right? And uh, uh, she's going to do it among the reeds. Now, that's what all people were told to do with baby boys is to throw them in the river and let them be, you know, taken away. So Technically, mom puts baby boy in the river. She followed the letter of the law. Now, obviously, she didn't do what was intended here. She's trying to save her baby, and so she puts him among the reeds. This is not an accident. She is doing this because she knows this is where the royal family bathes. She has a plan in mind. Now, she has no other plan than that than to put him in the place where she knows the royal family is going to be at some point. She doesn't know the outcome. There's been nothing promised to her about what's going to take place, but she did everything that she knew she could do. In other words, she moved in the direction of God. She moved in a direction. She moved towards something. She, she did something where she could say, God, I am, I am moving in a way that, that I am coming closer to you. She faced the right direction. I don't do a whole lot of weddings, but I used to do a lot of them. And unfortunately, I did lots of weddings where there was no wedding coordinator, and so guess who the wedding coordinator became? You're looking at him, Right? So I would help with these weddings. I was officiating these weddings, and we would do a rehearsal, and everybody counted on me to know what they were supposed to do. Where am I supposed to be next? Where am I? And so we would go through the instructions, right? We would kind of talk through the service, and then we would get everybody set up in the places that they're supposed to be. Then we'd walk through it. I'd go, to anybody have any questions? And in, inevitably, it would be a groomsman. Yeah, I don't know where I'm supposed to be. I don't know what I'm, we just talked through it and we walked through it and we're, okay, here's what, here's all you got to know how to do. This is what I would say. Wherever the bride is, you face her. That's all you got to know. Wherever the bride is, you face her. And so that guy would usually just do this through the whole service as she walked up the aisle. That's good advice if you're going to be in a, a, a wedding and you don't know which way you're supposed to face. The bride is the center of the attention, right? And so as you're coming in, you're facing the back. When she's up here, you're facing her. You face the bride because she's the center of attention at a wedding. We face Jesus, and when we face him, when we face his direction, you are facing the right direction. That's what Moses' mom does right here. She goes in the direction of God. In fact, if you're taking notes with me, let's just make it real simple. When you feel forgotten, just move in God's direction. You may not know what that is. You may not know what the outcome is. You may not be promised anything, but just move in that direction, right? Just move in that, that direction. You can lean in toward God. You may not know what that looks like. You may have to ask questions, but you can lean in the direction of God. That's what Moses' mom does. 
Now, before we leave that verse, there's an interesting word there, the word basket. It says papyrus basket in what I just read, only used one other time in the Old Testament. Used for when Noah built an ark. Same word, ark and basket. Interesting that God raised up that ark from the water and used that to save a remnant of of his creation, Noah's family. And in the same way, as we read through Exodus, God will raise up this ark, this basket and its contents, Moses, and God will use that to save his people from the bondage of slavery. Let's go to verse 4. So Moses is in the basket, and his sister, again, we don't know her name now, but later we find out it's Miriam, somewhere around chapter 15. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. So mom has evidently given her the task of doing reconnaissance, right? And so she's supposed to stay there. Mom put the, the basket in the reeds. There it is, uh, sitting still. And we're, uh, we're finding out that uh, sister's doing a little recon here, kind of keeping track, making sure crocodiles don't eat him or whatever, watching out for him. And so there they are. Verse 5 goes on and says, The Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, not a surprise, and her attendants were walking along the riverbank. She's in the water, they're up on the riverbank. She saw the basket among the reeds because she's in the water, they're on the riverbank, and sent her female slave to get it, okay? So female slave goes to get basket, and she opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. We're going to come back to that word right there. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. So she noticed this is one of the babies that that should have died, that should not be around right here. And here she is now feeling sorry. Now, I always thought, again, that this was an accident. They put Moses in the water and he kind of floated down and, you know, Pharaoh's daughter went, oh, looky there. What do we got? Oh, I can't believe it. It's a little baby. But that's not the way that happened. Moses' mom intentionally placed him there, knowing that royal family would be there, didn't know what would happen to him, but knew that they would ultimately come there. And it says that the daughter felt sorry. That phrase right there is the miracle of chapter 2 that mom could not have made happen. That's the factor that was completely out of her control. That was the thing that only God could do. She could put the basket there. She could do what she could, just moving in that direction. But she had no idea what the royal family or what this particular daughter of Pharaoh would do. This is the daughter of the one that called for the death of all the little boys. What she's doing when she feels sorry and ultimately is going to care for this child, what she did is against her culture. It goes against her family. It goes against her father's edict. It goes against her religion. And what we're doing is seeing God at work through her. Again, she becomes a hero in this this situation and saves Moses and, and continues God's plan. So Moses' family, specifically Moses' mom, trusting that God would do something. And they took a step of faith. Didn't know the outcome, but they just trusted God to do something. You know, there's another story about that in the New Testament of a woman who trusted that Jesus would do something. This is a woman who, uh, well, let me put it sensitively, she had her monthly period all the time. And now for 12 years, she's exhausted and she's frightened, and she's unhealthy, and she's anemic, and she doesn't know what to do. She spent all her money, the text tells us, on doctors, and nobody has helped. She hears that the healer, a guy named Jesus, is going to be in her town. And she thinks to herself, if I could just get close enough to touch the very edge of his robe, then that would heal me. 
I could just get that close. Now, remember, this is a woman who's considered unclean because of her health situation. She's not supposed to be touched by people. She's not supposed to touch anybody. But that day, Jesus walking through the crowds, people all around him, and she sees her chance, and she gets close, and she makes her way through, and she just touches it, and then she disappears into the crowd again. Except, Jesus says, who touched me? She disappears back a little further. The disciples are, what do you mean, Jesus? There's like a thousand people that have bumped into you. And he says, no, 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 this was special. I felt power leave me. Who touched me? And this woman reluctantly comes forward and volunteers that she was the one. And without opportunity to give any explanation, Jesus says, do you remember what he says to her? Daughter, your faith has healed you. The only time that Jesus calls someone daughter. Can you imagine somebody who has been rejected by everybody else and Jesus calls you daughter and then heals you? Your faith has healed you. She trusted in the mercy of God when there were no promises when there was no possibility that that was going to happen. And here what Moses' mom does is she trusts in God's mercy, that God was going to work in the heart of this pagan princess. And what a leap of faith. Would you just write it down this way in your notes? Would you write down that when you feel like you've been forgotten, when you feel like you're forgotten, trust God to do something. Just trust him. Trust God to do something at that moment. That's what Moses' mom does. Like something is going to happen here. Okay, let's go on to verse 7. Exodus chapter 2, verse 7. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter. Remember, she's kind of uncovered. Oh, I've got this Hebrew baby, and she has mercy on him. She feels sorry for him. And Moses' sister says, shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Hey, do you want me to find a nanny? Do you want me to find somebody to provide some child care? Would you like me to do that? Verse 8, the answer is go. Go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Just go and do it. Didn't give her any specific parameters or, you know, defining qualities here. Just, Just go do it. So here we are. Mom trusted God, hoping that this royal family would take him in. And she's waiting, she's waiting, Miriam's out watching, Miriam finally comes into the house and says, you're not going to believe what just happened. What happened? It, what, what happened? Did they take him in? Yeah, yeah, they took him in. Is he safe? Yeah, yeah, he's safe, but there's more. You got a job. The mother of Moses gets a job. Look, what it, look at this, verse 9. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will, I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. So here we've got Moses' own mom. I want you to make sure you catch all that's going on right here. Moses' own mom is being instructed to do this. Take your baby. They're going to let her take Moses home and raise him. And later on, this baby is going to become a member of the royal family and is going to get all those benefits, but right now mom gets to take baby home and raise him and get paid to do it. You got to love what God's doing right here and how he goes about getting it done. So Moses will spend probably four years at least at home. That was kind of the period of nursing before a child was weaned. Not only that, he could be raised at home publicly wouldn't have to hide anymore without any fear that somebody's going to come along no 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 this is royal family said said this isn't that amazing how they walked in the blessing of god and so here's mom raising her own child getting paid to do it verse 10 though the day came when the child grew older she took him to pharaoh's daughter and he became her son She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. We took a peek at that verse last week just to kind of give us some some bearing here. And so that kind of sets the stage for us now. Moses living in the home of Pharaoh, Pharaoh's daughter raising him up. And then we're going to get to the period of time in this next glimpse of Scripture 
where Moses is 40 years old, okay? It doesn't say it in the text, but we know that's the case because Acts 7.23, again, when Stephen is telling the story, probably tells it with some of the actual Jewish history involved in it. He says when Moses was 40 years old, he decided to visit his own people, the Israelites. Again, we get more information the verse before that. Moses was educated. This is Acts 7.22. Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in speech and action. So this man has turned into a leader. Forty years old, he has been trained. He knows Egyptian math and science and language, and he has grown up to be an incredible leader. Notice it says he was powerful in speech. That's going to become interesting when we get to the point where God says, I got a job for you, and he says, Lord, I can't speak very well. He is powerful in speech and action. Hebrews 11.24 says, By faith Moses, when he'd grown up, refused to be known as the son of the daughter of Pharaoh. He kind of rejects this. Though he was raised in the royal family, there was a point where he says, I am not, I am not a part of this family. In fact, what we see is an early picture of Jesus who left heaven, left riches, left splendor, came down to this earth, became human, uh, it says he became a servant and ultimately died on the cross. Jesus gave up all of that. Philippians 2 is a great song that gives that story. In fact, Hebrews 11.25 tells us more. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God. Rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin, he regarded disgrace for, the, disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. Moses at some point in his life said, I can choose all of the goodness of this royal family and being a part of that and leading people and, and, and being in front and having every rich that I want or I can choose to be with my people, and I can look ahead, and I can choose to do what God wants me to do. Moses knew God had something in mind for him, but he's not sure how to do it, right? Isn't that where we find ourselves? God has something in store for us, but we're confused about how it's supposed to happen. Verse 11, one day after Moses had grown up, how old is he again? He's 40. He went out to where his own people were, and he watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. So we know that was taking place. That was in chapter 1, right? The, the Israelites were slaves to the Hebrew people. Moses grew up in the royal family, maybe, maybe never even knew that. But one day he goes out, and he actually sees this, and he's going to respond to it. In fact, Moses is going to make a mistake. He's going to do something that he probably would look back and go, I wish I could redo that. Happened to you at some point in your life? You look back and you're like, if I could go back and redo that. If I could go back, you, you've got some regrets. You've got some things that you look back and maybe it was last week or last month or last year or last decade or way, way, way back there and you're like, that's the thing that I would undo. Moses is about to do that, verse 12. Looking this way and that and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. So the guy that is beating his fellow countrymen, Moses goes and he kills that guy, murders him. He killed someone. So if you're hearing this story for the first time and you've, you've known about a guy named Moses and now you're thinking, wait a minute, I thought Moses was a great man of God. I thought Moses was like a famous man in the Bible. I thought Moses was, let my people go and Pharaoh let his people go. And I thought he was a really good guy. Well, he was. But he still made a mistake. Still messed up. He was still, he was still broken. In fact, it says he looked that way, this way and that. that. That's not something you do when you're going to do something good, right? That's something to do when you've, you've got something evil intended. What we're going to find out is that when you think no one else is looking, people are looking. If you think you're doing something in secret, guess what? Moses thought he was doing something. He looked around. Nobody, it seemed, was paying attention, but someone was looking. And what Moses is going to have to learn is that deliverance wouldn't come from his hand. It would come from the hand of God. Verse 13, 
The next day he went out and he saw two Hebrews fighting. So he's back among his people now. They're fighting this time, and he asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? Why would you do that? Why aren't you being nice to other people? We have enough other people uh, hitting, hitting each other. And, uh, yeah, so that's, that's, that's a problem. Why, why would you do that? The judge, the man said, who made you ruler and judge? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must have become known. And what Moses is finding out is that leadership is hard. It doesn't just come easy. You don't just stand up in front and go, okay, here's what we're going to do. It doesn't happen that way. Some of you are realizing that. People didn't want him. People didn't want to follow him. And now he's getting push, pushed back from the very people that he suspects. I've got some hand in delivering them. They're not listening to me. They don't want to do what I say. I'm just trying to help. I'm trying to promote peace here. What do we do about this? Verse 15. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian. Why are all the people so mad at Moses? Well, it's understandable that Pharaoh would be mad at him. Pharaoh finds out about it, and, you know, it's kind of like a disgrace to the family. You've rejected us. You've rejected my leadership. You're fighting against us. I can see why, why he's mad. Why why are the Hebrew people, his fellow people, why are they mad at him? Well, when everybody finds out about the Egyptian getting murdered, guess who's going to get punished? It's not just Moses. Everybody's going to get punished. Everybody's going to have more work to do. Everybody's going to feel the wrath of Pharaoh and the wrath of of the Egyptians. In fact, this won't be the last time that Moses has to deal with that when he does something and it makes it harder on his people. We'll see that over the next couple of couple of teaching times. Uh, And so here we here we are in this in, in this situation. Moses has made things worse. Moses has tried to do things on his own and he has made things worse. That's what that's what happens. We just go off and do whatever we want to do. He's trying to take on the role of deliverer. He's trying to take things in his own hands. He wants to do something, but but he really hasn't checked in with God about it. In fact, let's just say it this way if you're writing notes. When you feel forgotten, avoid taking matters into your own hands because it's easy to do that. It's hard to define where I'm taking a step of faith and then when I take a take matters into my own hands, but it's obvious here Moses acted in anger. He's doing something because he's, he's upset, he's angry. He knew he's called to deliver God's people, but he never bothered to check signals with God. In fact, we're not told anywhere about him praying, asking God, is this what I need to do? He just acted on his own. So at this point, Moses seems to be dedicated to the will of God. Moses, unfortunately, is not really trying to, to dedicate himself to God. There's a difference, isn't there? Sometimes we want to know the will of God. God, what do you want me to do? God, what's my plan? What, what, what is... When really what God wants from us is for us to be near to him, to abide with him. And, and when we avoid that and when we take the shortcut and we just jump into taking matters into our own hands and we leave God completely out of the loop, then what happens often is what happens to Moses. Acts 7, 25 says, Moses thought his own people would realize that God was using him to rescue them, but they did not. They didn't realize that that was the case. It wasn't time yet. So Moses flees and escapes to a place called Midian. I'm going to show it to you on the map in just a minute, but you need to know this, that the people of Midian, they were descendants of Abraham, like the Israelites were, but they were like distant cousins. They didn't like each other. The people of Midian, they did not like the Israelites. So why would Moses go there if the people there didn't like his people? Well, the thing that saved him was the people of Midian didn't like Egyptians worse. <laughs> they, they hated the Egyptians. And so they didn't like the Israelites, but they hated the Egyptians even more. So it became an opportunity for him to go 
go there. In fact, let's look at it on the map just so you can see. This is, this is actually modern-day Google Maps right here. This is the area that is the hot button of all the conversations right now, right, with uh, uh, Israel and Palestine and, and all of that. That's the mess right there. But just right around the corner here is Egypt, right? Mediterranean Sea. And this little river called the Nile River, and this is called the Delta of the Nile right here, very fertile soil right there. In fact, when we read at the end of Genesis where uh, the Hebrew people, that they kind of camped out in what's called the land of Goshen, and that's that in that northeastern area of, of uh, that Nile Delta. And so they're in Egypt right there. What Moses is going to do is, is he going to travel all the way over here? This is, this is that area of Midian. He is a long, long way from the people of Egypt. He has fled. He has fled for his life, and he is looking to get away from everything. And this is what happens when he gets there, verse 15. He sat down by a well. Now, a priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw water and to fill the troughs to work their father's flock. But here's Moses sitting down by the well in a posture of surrender, of just giving up, of just being a failure. He finally gets away from Egypt, and he's traveled, and now he's done, he's tried, he's failed, and who shows up but some women trying to trying to water, uh, water their, their sheep. Verse 17, some shepherds came along and drove them away, but Moses got up and he came to the rescue and watered their flock. I don't know what you think about Moses, but probably the old Ten Commandments, a buff dude, you know, that played in the Ten Commandments, that old show. I mean, that's probably, probably the case. Here he chases off the bullies. Then he does the work for these ladies that had come, come there. Um, by the way, second time he's been concerned about justice and rescuing and taking care of vulnerable people. And so he does all of that. Verse 18, when the girls returned to rule their father, he asked them, why have you returned so early today? How would you get done so quick? And they're going to tell him, well, this guy Moses helped us. But before we do that, we've got to deal with a tough question. This guy ruled their father. We know, we know Moses is going to marry one of those ladies. But I thought Moses' father-in-law's name was Jethro. We'll see that a few chapters down the road. Who is this guy? Same guy, he's just going by a couple of different names, okay? This is the same father-in-law. This is Jethro. When we get to that, he's going to go by the same, no, uh, same name. Just so you know, it's the same guy. Their response, verse 19, is an Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds. He even drew water for us, and he watered the flock. This guy was really good to us. He rescued us. We think he's an Egyptian probably because of the way that Moses was dressed. They thought that he was, he was Egyptian, and so this guy took care of us, and, and uh, yeah, it was all good. Verse 20. And where is he? The father asked his daughter, why'd you leave him? Invite him to have something to eat. Why, why would you just let him stay out there? Don't you have some manners? Moses agreed to stay with the man who gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses in marriage. So you, he stays and eats and then eventually gets married to one of this man's daughters. And so that's a crazy kind of story here. But what we see is it's almost like Moses has decided to settle. Like Moses is just like, I've tried, I've failed, and now I'm just going to, I'm just going to, I'm just done. I, I'm going to become the greeter at Walmart. I'm just going to, you know, take the easy, I'm just going to, I, I can't do it. I'm just going to go with the flow. And so he just says, I've made mistakes. I'm going to be content with whatever it is. I'll just stay here. And so he gets married. Verse 22, we read about, he has a son. Zippor gave birth to a son. Moses named him Gershom. I don't know anybody named Gershom right now. But this is what Gershom means. I've become a foreigner in a foreign land. In fact, probably a better translation of the word Gershom would be banished. I've been banished by my own people. I've been banished by the Egyptians. So this is what Moses is feeling, and he just kind of puts it off on his son. Moses is a refugee, a wanted man from Egypt, and he's a foreigner in Midian, and he feels 
like a failure. Easy to feel that way, isn't it? Easy to feel that way in relationships with people. Easy to feel that way maybe in your job. Easy to feel that way with just the way that life goes on. Maybe you wake up in the morning, you just feel like a failure, like Moses. This is the good news, though, because we know the end of this story that as long as you have breath, God hasn't given up on you. As long as you're still breathing, God still has something in store for you. It's easy to put labels on ourselves, feel like you're a mistake, feel like you're a loser, feel like you're a failure. You look around and it looks like looks like everybody else has it all together. I've, I'm a failure. I realize that a guy named Winston Churchill, somebody asked him one time, what prepared you to lead through the time of World War II? If you remember early on in World War II, Winston Churchill, Prime Minister of, of England, and they were kind of in it on their own against uh, Nazi Germany and, and, and all of that difficult, difficult time uh, for Churchill. This was his response. He says, what prepared me was the time I repeated a class in grade school. And the person that was asking the question said, you mean you flunked a grade? Winston Churchill said, I never flunked in my life. I was given a second opportunity to get it right. I was given a second opportunity to get it right. So you can see mistakes in your life as failure, or you can see them as another opportunity to get things right. That's exactly what God is going to do with this man, Moses. He's at a down point in his life right now, but God is going to use him in an amazing way. Okay, last scene of this chapter, and it's going to wrap us up, verse 23. During that long period, it's just talking about that time now that Moses lives in Midian, he's left Egypt, and he's married, and he's living the shepherd life. During that long period, we think 40 years, the king of Egypt died. And the Israelites groaned in their slavery. They're still slaves, and they cried out. And their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. So they're still living this difficult life, but something new happens is during this long period of time, they begin to cry out. I mean, that's that's a long time to wait, isn't it? Forty years, it's a long time to know that God has something in store for you, but it seems like nothing is happening. But we know behind the scenes God is preparing That's what he does. In fact, in Genesis, we read about Joseph in prison for 13 years, 13 long years. You get to the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, before he's an apostle, in the wilderness, Arabian desert, for three years. We don't even know anything of what happened during that time frame, and yet God was preparing him, getting ready to do something. And so God here, it says, heard their cries during that period God heard their cries. He remembered. God God remembered that. I I love that. God, God God is up to doing something. But the Israelites are praying to God. Verse 25, God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God God looked down, he heard, he remembered. By the way, when it says remembered right there, it's not like all of a sudden God remembered recollected his thoughts and, and thought, I've got, to, I've got to address this. I forgot all about it. That's, that's not what's going on right here. That word actually has to do with application, covenant application. Probably a better way to say it is God decided to honor his, the terms of his covenant at the time. In other words, God decided now's the time to do something about the promises, the promises that he would bless Abraham's descendants. The promise that he would not only bless them, but he would curse those who curse them. And the Egyptian nation is about to feel the curse of God because of the way that they've treated his people. So last verse, verse 25, God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. God heard, he remembered, he looked or he saw, and now it says he was concerned concerned, maybe even a better way to say that is God knew. God was interested in his people and making himself known to them. God looked down 
and he made himself known to them. It starts with the people crying out to God. Oh, they were miserable. Those words we looked at, they cried out, they moaned. Multiple different words right there being used just to show how bad it was for them. And they finally cry out to God. There are many historians that think that right here, it happens at this time. The exodus happens at this time because God's people finally return to seeking him. Would you just leave with this thought right here? When you are feeling forgotten, cry out to God. That's the time to amp up your prayers. That's the time to spend getting close to him. That's the time to stop trying to figure out what you're doing and do what the Israelite people finally got around to doing. Why do we wait so long? Why do we try so hard on our own? What if we just cried out to God to begin with? So, Father God, that's what we're doing right now. We're doing that on behalf of some people Maybe in, in, in your presence right now, in, the pres- in this room right now, maybe some people online who just are at the end. They are in a battle. They're struggling. They feel like a failure. They feel like they're done. They're feeling forgotten by you. We're crying out. Maybe they can't even do it on their own right now, but we cry out to you, Father, because we need help, and we need a Savior, and we need you to move. And we know that you moving is not limited to old stories in, in our Bibles that happened a long time ago. We know that you still move and you still act. And so we cry out for that. And we thank you for your promises that you will be with us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.